Welcome back to The Explanation Pro. Today I'll recap a drama adventure film called, The Way Back. Spoilers incoming. The movie begins during World War II. Janiseks, a Polish army officer, is being questioned by one of the Soviet commanders in Poland. Since Janiseks refuses to admit being a Soviet spy, they had to torture his wife to accept the allegations. In fact, the Soviets forced the wife to sign a confession statement as proof of her guilt. They try to extract a statement condemning him from his wife under pressure. For the next 20 years, he will be held in a labor camp in Siberia's Gulag. Prisoners, including Janiseks, are moved to the camp amidst a thick layer of ice. The newly arriving inmates are told by a man that anybody trying to flee will be shot. The escapee will be killed by nature and the people of the surrounding village, who despise the prisoners. Before being sent to the camp, all of the inmates' hair is shaved off. They fight over trench coats. Later that night, Janiseks and other prisoners are lining up for their food rations. One of the other prisoners is dying of malnutrition, and he notices him. Mr. Smith, an American prisoner, refuses to give the blind man a part of his food when Janiseks asks him for a piece. Mr. Smith tells Janiseks that being excellent in the camp may be dangerous. He is approached by another prisoner called Kabarov, an actor who informs him that Soviet leader Stalin despises Americans, and that is why Mr. Smith is in the camp. Kabarov formally presents himself to Janiseks and inquires about the latter's charges. Janiseks stands trial on charges of spying. In contrast, Kabrov is charged with sabotage for a decade. In his last job as an actor, Zaborov took on the character of an aristocrat. He was imprisoned because he was suspected of raising the status of the ancient nobles. Both of them enter the cabin at once. Volka has played cards with another prisoner at the cabin, a hardcore Russian criminal. When Janiseks tries to gaze at Volka, Kabarov tells him he will die. The camp's guards let the criminal control things, and they should be dreaded for their actions. A year inside is all it will take for Kabrov to tell him that Stalin has eyes and ears everywhere, so he must be very cautious in what he does. Janiseks inquires as to how long Kabarov has been in the camp. It's been 11 months and 29 days since Kabrov's last freedom. Meanwhile, a prisoner is forced to surrender his coat to Volka, who takes it. He passes the coat over as ordered. Volka, on the other hand, insists on having the jacket. The prisoner refuses, stating that he lacks the right to make such demands on everyone else. A furious Volka stabs the prisoner in the stomach. The prisoner is given a taste of Volka's ferocity from that point on. The next day, the prisoners are let out to do errands. Some are engaged in the construction of bridges, while others are working in mining. The peak of the mountain is clearly visible from Janiseks's present position. Volka interrupts Kabarov's favorite pastime of drawing a random prisoner later in the evening. Meanwhile, Janiseks is having issues with the lice he acquired in his jacket. Kabarov steps in to assist and takes him outdoors to resolve his problem. When they hear an explosion from the mining site, Kabarov starts hiding the clothing in the ice. They both just shrug it off and go back to work on Janiseks's lice issue. Suddenly, Kabarov informs Janusz in secret that he and another prisoner called Lazar, a former construction site foreman in the woods, are planning to escape. During the conversation, Kabarov informs Janiseks that he has been searching for a person like him willing to risk their lives to escape the camp. After reaching Lake Baikal, Kabarov intends to continue on to Mongolia. However, since the trip to the south is so lengthy, they must first stockpile supplies. Janiseks intends to bring along some of his most reliable allies. Prisoners are selected the next day to participate in mining. For a brief period, Janiseks seems to have visions of an old country home's front entrance, complete with plants and a strange rock that he is reaching for. Later, it's snowing when Janiseks and the other prisoners depart the mining site. Janiseks figures that now is the best time to go since their footprints will be completely hidden by the snow. However, it comes out that Kabarov is frightened and unsure of his ability to pack up and leave. Janiseks chooses to carry out Kabarov's dream to keep his morale. A Polish man who is blind at night, Kazakh and Voss, a Latvian priest and a Yugoslav accountant, Voss and Zorin have begun exchanging supplies for their escape in addition to the escapee. As Janiseks waits for the lights to go out, Volka appears beside him with a knife to the throat. Janiseks agrees to include Volka in the escape plot once the latter insists on it. A little while later, when the snow fell harder, 
Janicex and the other prisoners manage to leave the camp and make their way to freedom. Due to the thick snowfall, the guards cannot see where they are heading. They let the dogs go, too. The prisoners continue until the cold has taken its toll on several escaped prisoners. Even yet, Janicex manages to come up with a plan to keep going. On the second day of their journey, the prisoners discuss their travel time. There is a lot of food to go around, so they share it with each other. Mr. Smith, Volka, and Janicex are exploring the woods searching for clues as to where they should go next. They continue on their journey as the snow begins to fall hard. For the second time in a few hours, they take a break from their journey. Lake Baikal will not be reached for another three to four weeks. The prisoners and Janicex are planning their next plan of action to consider how to survive the epic journey ahead. Mr. Smith, Kazakh, and Janicex have gone to the forest to gather dry trees for the campfire. When Mr. Smith attempts to contact Kazakh, he receives no response. Kazakh suffers from night blindness, therefore, he must return to the area before it becomes dark. However, Kazakh freezes to death when he loses his way back to the area, and the group buries him and offers a prayer before they depart the campsite. During their treks, the inmates come to a cave to sketch some drawings. They take a break in the cave before continuing on their journey. Volka speculates who of the other Janicex prisoners will be the first to be eaten. They've been walking for days and haven't eaten in days. They observe wolves devouring a dead animal in the cave. They are so desperate for food that they call in the wolves, who attack the dead animal to get its flesh. While the other prisoners remain in the cave, Janicex sets off on his own. Janicex returned to the cave after a three-day battle against good and poor weather to find Lake Baikal. Other prisoners hear about the good news from him. To get to the lake, they collected some energy and kept going. They're walking through the woods when they see they're being followed. They come upon Irena, a Polish lady. When they ask her about her parents, she says that Russian forces killed them and put her on a communal farm outside Warsaw, where they abused her terribly, so she fled. Irena decides to join the rest of the prisoners. Prisoners in Lake Baikal happen to shower and have their hair and nails done before going to a neighboring town. They need to maintain a good appearance to avoid being identified as robbers and criminals. In Mr. Smith's mind, Irena's story begins the inaccuracy. The prisoners and Irena will have to cross the ice-filled river. Janicex, on the other hand, believes that the ice will not be able to support their weight, so they intend to swim the river instead. Irena sprinted over the river as quickly as she could to join the rest of the prisoners, all of whom were following her. Not long after that, Mr. Smith starts asking Irena questions unrelated to anything she said to the group thus far. Eventually, Mr. Smith criticizes her for lying and warns her that he will not tolerate them anymore. Meanwhile, the prisoners clearly view the unguarded border between Russia and Mongolia. They discovered Volka had vanished before they reached the border. They have reason to believe that he will abandon the mission and turn them into the Soviets. It's only that their suspicions are unjustified. Since they've been starved for weeks, Volka is out in the woods searching for food. This is a special day for Volka, since it is his birthday. They eat the meat Volka caught that night while they celebrate. Irena is well known for fabricating tales. If she doesn't come up with new stories, they'll go without her. She was taken from her parents and placed in an orphanage, even though they were communists. The next day, they resume their journey. While being bitten by mosquitoes, they hide in the bush. Insects do not bother them when they see a group of humans heading their way. Zoran is fed up with being hounded by insects, so he approaches a man to inquire why they aren't bitten by insects. The man generously provided him with one as soon as he learned that they were using a mosquito repellent. The remainder of the prisoners whipped up their insect repellents and kept on the march. They can cross Lake Baikal successfully. The prisoners have crossed the Mongolian border and arrived in Mongolia. Because of the presence of guards, they intend to sneak in at night. Volka still considers Russia his homeland and regards Joseph Stalin as a hero convinces him to remain. Both Janicex and Volka say their last goodbyes. Only a few of the prisoners are still on their way to the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. When they arrive at the border, they are greeted with a Stalin-themed arch and a red star signifying that Mongolia has become a communist nation. A ruined temple consisting of skulls and bones is found by chance. In response to a question from Irena, Toma said that Russia went through the same situation with Russia. They have decided to leave Mongolia China since they no longer feel comfortable there. 
however, it is also a communist country. As a result, they plan to go to India through the Himalayas. The Chinese guards intercept them as they make their way to their location and question their plans. Tomas's common languages and Mr. Smith's American nationality make him a perfect match. As a result, the guards have dispersed, and they may proceed. As a result, they can now see all the way to the south through the peak's rim. Due to the extreme heat and a shortage of water, they become more vulnerable as they go south across the Gobi Desert. Both Tomas and Janusz are debating whether or not they should continue south or find another way to obtain water and food to stay alive. Janusz insists that the well they're seeing is only an illusion and not the real thing. A well filled with birds gives them some temporary relief. Everyone still craves freedom and refuses to settle for anything less. However, a sandstorm strikes soon after they leave, causing them to lose almost all of their water supplies. The prisoners, realizing that they would never locate the well again, continue on their journey. Several times, Irena falls to the ground. Despite her best efforts, Irena surrenders to her thirst and illness. Irena is buried, and the surviving prisoners continue their journey south. They've been running low on water for a few days now. They are just sharing a little portion of the water they have left. Tomas's health is failing as they continue their trek. The remaining prisoners are urged to continue on their own without him. Tomas succumbs to his illness and dies a few days later. However, Mr. Smith is critically dehydrated and on the point of passing out. When Zoran spies a snake, it leads him to a watering hole. It satisfies their thirst for a short time. They hunt and consume the snakes that wander around them. They spend the night there to recharge for the next days. Mr. Smith tells Janusz everything about his family. He gives him the push he needs to return to his family and start over. Janusz has the same problem. With the help of Janusz, Mr. Smith can restore his strength and continue the journey to China with his buddies. Four very thirsty inmates uncover a source of water they desperately need. If not for the other prisoners, Mr. Smith would have already died to exhaustion if he hadn't been saved by them. At last, after days of travel, Andres comes upon China's Great Wall. They keep going till they reach the Himalayas-Tibet border. On their way to the Himalayas, they come upon a Tibetan monk who leads them back to the Buddhist monastery, where they can recover from their exhaustion. They've been told to postpone their journey to Lhasa for three months until spring. One of the monk's acquaintances agrees to sneak Mr. Smith out of China through a trip to Lhasa. Once he arrives, he expects to contact the U.S. military, ensuring his return to the United States. The remaining three walk across the Himalayas and arrive in India, where they are helped by locals and farmers. They are asked where they are from by the Indians who welcome them. The narrative they told the Indian minister stunned him. For their safety, the Indian government provides assistance. The movie ends with Janusz 45 years later, and after the fall of communism in Poland, Janusz returns home to reunite with his wife. For all those years, he wanted to see his wife again so he could forgive her and she could forgive herself. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video please hit the like button and also subscribe my channel for more videos like this. See you in the next video.